fact, if you look at food in the 19th century, especially commercially produced, industrially manufactured food, it was insanely bad. Milk was watered down. It was then recolored with chalk or plaster of Paris. Sometimes people would do fake cream by pureeing calf brains and floating them on top of the milk, which is just like really disgusting. And then because it was both watered and not produced in sterile circumstances, people would dump preservatives in it. And, and that's where you really see formaldehyde come into play because formaldehyde is a great milk preservative. It actually disguises the breakdown of some of the proteins and it's sweet so it would restore some of the fresh taste of milk. They had epidemics of children who died in orphanages from the use of formaldehyde in milk before we took it out of the food supply. At the turn of the 20th century, the state of America's food supply was atrocious. One chemist, employing some questionable methods, set out to fix it. That's the subject of this podcast in the new book, The Poison Squad, written by science journalist extraordinaire Deborah Blum. I am CNN senior correspondent and Stereochemistry Book Club founder Lisa Jarvis. Last month, I got to sit down with Deborah in her office in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to talk about The Poison Squad, which hits your local bookstores on September 25th. If Deborah's name sounds familiar, it should. She's the current director of MIT's Night Science Journalism Program and publisher of the nonprofit digital magazine on Dark. Full disclosure, she's also a member of CNN's advisory board. Deborah's written several great books, including The Poisoner's Handbook, which is a thriller about the birth of forensic science, and The Monkey Wars, which explores the use of primates in research. She won a Pulitzer Prize in 1992 for reporting on that topic for the Sacramento Bee. Now, with The Poison Squad, Deborah gives us a meticulously researched look at how Harvey Wiley, despite significant opposition from industry and from inside the government, managed to get the Pure Food and Drug Act passed in 1906. Not only did it ban adulterated or mislabeled products, it eventually led to the creation of the U.S. FDA. Without Wiley, we might still be drinking our milk with a side of formaldehyde or dipping our fries in ketchup lace with rotting meat. Deborah graciously hosted me in her office in Cambridge to talk about why she got so caught up in this one crusading chemist story and how her ideas about Wiley changed over the course of researching the book. And in the interview you're about to hear, we also spent some time discussing how the story fits into the modern cultural and political climate. What would Wiley, who devoted his life to ensuring the safety of our food and drug supply, think of this administration's efforts to limit the regulatory reach of the government? We've edited the discussion for length and clarity. I wanted to talk to you about your fascinating new book, The Poison Squad, and I wonder if you could just start by telling us a little bit about Harvey Wiley and how you decided to choose him as the main character. You know, how did you stumble upon his, maybe stumble upon isn't the right word, but how did you find his story? I mean, stumble is close. <laughs> so I'm very interested in poison, and I was looking at the, some of the early 20th century reports on different poisonings, and I stumbled actually sort of backed into him because I had found this experiment he worked on that was nicknamed the Poison Squad, in which he was testing uh, food additives on innocent government employees, which you could not do today. And I was so intrigued by that, right? Why would you do it? And how could you talk anyone into it? And who was this guy? So I went backwards from there. And, and in the course of going backwards, I eventually realized that I had stumbled on something that's a kind of forgotten story about America's first great food safety chemist. So I wanted to ask if there was any part of your research where you started diving into this story and you thought, this is a book, like I got it. <laughs> My idea of what the book was changed as I did the research, which happens all the time. I actually had an editor who said to me, I said, well, it's nothing like my proposal. And she goes, oh, Deborah, that was only a proposal. So this particular book is the third book that I had done uh, with my editor at Penguin Press. And for better or for worse, when I sold this book, I didn't know the whole story. And so I just wrote her a kind of letter, it was maybe five or six pages, in which I said, I think this could be a really cool story. And here's some of the issues that strike me as fascinating on the surface. And then when I got into the book, I was like, whoa, I completely did not know what that story was. Mostly because I think I hadn't appreciated the depths of the politics. Yeah, I'm a science journalist, right? I was really thinking about the science of food and the chemistry of food and how we explore that. And 
afterwards, if you could picture me smacking myself in the head, which I'm doing right now, I was like, what was I thinking? This guy was a federal scientist. He was involved in the creation of our first grade food and drug safety law. This is politics and American history. And so I had to really go back and say, well, you know, the chemistry of ketchup is a really fascinating thing. And it is actually, but it's not my story. My story is this paradigm shifting idea of how we recognize what good food is, how we test for it, and how if we're lucky, we listen to the scientist and the science itself in figuring out how to uh, set policy and protect everyone else who lives in the country. Had, had he not been successful, you know, let's talk about some of the just truly almost stomach turning (laughs) things that people were adding to food. And I have to say that this book reinforced my belief that ketchup is a suspect condiment. Um, (laughs) Yes. Early ketchup was really disgusting, right? (laughs) And they had to pour all kinds of chemicals in it because they used a lot of rotting materials in it, right? It was super cheap. There were other enormously, you know, sometimes you can almost laugh at them, but enormous cheats. So one of the things they used to do to kind of extend brown sugar is they would grind up insects. And this is back in the day when grocers would have like barrels of sugar that they would scoop out for you. So there was then a condition called grocer's itch because not all of the insects were fully ground and grocers would get like lice infestations and they would get other bug bites. They got so proficient at faking coffee, which was often like dyed sawdust and stuff. But then they learned how to fake the coffee beans because people would go, oh, I'll just get the beans. They can't be fake. So you can actually find flyers to grocers for fake coffee beans, which could be made out of like wax and dirt, right? And then they would basically thin the coffee with these guys. And they would put ground stone into flour. They would fake spices like uh, cinnamon or, I'm thinking of red spices here, cayenne. They were almost always brick dust with a little bit of pepper flavoring or spice added to them. And uh, they would uh, grind up shells, seashells of coconut shells, burnt rope, you name it, it went into foods. And you know, honey was often just corn syrup dyed, but they had special molds to make fake honeycomb to float in it. So it wasn't just that they were faking these things, but they were like ingeniously faking these things. And all of this was legal, from the poisoning of children with formaldehyde to the complete fakery of, you know, maple syrup. There was no laws at all to regulate that. And every time someone tried to do it, the industry would beat it back. So it was really a crazy time. In Europe, in Canada, they had some of these regulations, but the the American don't tell me what to do. There were actually chemists. There was a chemist in New York who wrote, it's the, the big problem for America, right? The American independence, you can't tell me what to do. It's my right to poison food. I wanted to hear, you know, from you, since we you named it the Poison Squad. I mean, first tell our listeners what the Poison Squad is. From our perspective in the 20th century, the Poison Squad experiment seems so entirely insane. Uh, Wiley actually called this experiment hygienic table trials. But the Washington Post, which was at that point really a... Uh, enterprising newspaper and very creative, nicknamed it the Poison Squad. And and what he had decided, just to back up for a minute, he was the chief of the Bureau of Chemistry at the Department of Agriculture. There was no FDA. The Bureau of Chemistry is the forerunner of the FDA. But at that time, agriculture was responsible for food safety entirely. And his tiny little bureau, which was in, at least he started in a basement at USDA, uh, was responsible for the food safety of the entire country. So he he had been tracking problems with unregulated food because food was entirely unregulated by the federal government in the 19th century. And he started doing reports on this horrible quality of food. And he was tracking fraud and fakery, but he also started worrying in the late 19th as we see the use of more industrial chemistry in food, that we were throwing these things into food and we had no idea uh, what they were or how they affected people. And there was no safety testing. There was no requirement because there was no regulation. And people were just like, oh, well, no one's dropping dead on the street. Although some children were dying, right, from the use of formaldehyde in food. So he finally said, how do I get people 
people to take this seriously and how do I figure out what's going on? And so he decided that the way he would do it is he would just skip the animal testing and test human beings. And that today, you could never do that, right? And so he actually persuaded a lot of young government workers to, I, you know, you know, I usually say flippantly, dine dangerously, but basically he offered them three free meals a day if they would come and eat in a Department of Agriculture kitchen and eat very healthy food and swallow capsules full of preservatives. And that was the poison squat experiment. He actually put did formaldehyde and had to call that off early, but he looked at borax, he looked at copper sulfate, he looked at sodium benzoate, which is still in the food supply today. So he's really waiting for people to get sick in these experiments, which in fact they did. And that experiment caught national attention and played a role in how we began to try to address the issues of unregulated food. When you went into the research, did you have any thoughts about who you expected Wiley was going to be, you know, and, and did he turn out to be the person you thought he was going to be? My idea of Wiley changed usually in the course of the research. When I saw that experiment, I thought, that's such a an incredible risky experiment. And so the mental picture that I first had of this was of this incredibly inventive, risk-taking, out there kind of chemist who was just almost like a free spirit of chemistry, right? Someone who would just gamble on people's lives in this crazy way. And I expected him kind to be, like I said, this kind of really out there, unpredictable guy. He was not that. And I found myself disagreeing with him in ways that I hadn't expected, which you may pick up from the book. So he was born um, in the mid 19th century. He actually served briefly as a Union soldier in the Civil War. He got a chemistry degree from Harvard, which involved less than a year of study because this is the 19th century. And he had become very early on interested in issues of food fraud and safety when he was the first chemistry professor at Purdue University, which at that point had a faculty of six. So, you know, it was a very different time. But the other thing about him was that he was raised by a father who was uh, deeply religious, was a lay preacher, was a conductor on the Underground Railroad, and expected his children to crusade for a better world. So you see Wiley bringing both this incredibly new science of chemistry, because he described it as a wilderness, right? But we're just getting started building a periodic table and figuring figuring out what things are and how to synthesize them. And he was he loved that part of it. But he also felt that he had to use chemistry in this kind of higher moral, moral calling way. So you see him bringing, even to his job at USDA, this kind of religiously moral intensity. And he's very um, inflexible about that. He, and he believes, I don't think he was wrong about this, he believes that the government's job is to protect the American citizen and consumer. That's it. And everything else falls away. And he takes that. I just, I find this both admirable and frustrating, right? He takes that as this higher calling and he crusades and crusades and crusades and eventually wins at least the first food safety law. But he also, he just won't compromise. And because he won't compromise, some of the power that he could have had for good, I think gets taken away from him. So you see this almost like a Greek tragedy kind of thing with him in which he's pushing for pure and better and safer food for all Americans. He's completely right about what he wants, but he is always in the pulpit. And I think. And so you find people trying to rein him in, whereas if he was a little more boringly pragmatic, he might have actually been more effective. And so I try to get, without being judgmental in the book, you're hearing me be a lot more judgmental than I am in the book, but I try to really describe this very precisely so that people can also say, well, here's where I think he succeeded and here's where I think he could have been stronger at what he did. I, I mean, I want people to see him as the whole complicated person who only wants to do good. I mean, it's an interesting point. I only want to do good, and I'm so unforgiving of my need to do good that I don't do as much good as I wish. 
We'll continue our interview with Deborah in a moment and get into how she thinks Wiley would view the state of food safety and regulation today. But first, a quick plug for another awesome project we have in the works for you at CNN. Hi there, Carmen Drawl here. If you're like me, you're on the edge of your seat waiting for the annual announcement of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry coming up on October 3rd. You can warm up for the big day with us on September 27th as CNN teams up with ACS webinars to bring you our annual Nobel Prize predictions webinar. CNN executive editor Lauren Wolf and I will be joined by a panel of special guests as we discuss our picks for the prize, along with this year's big chemistry ideas and a healthy dose of Nobel trivia. The panel will include Nicole Gadelli and Joseph Moran, both members of this year's class of talented 12 chemists, as well as UCLA's Neil Garg, an organic chemist and award-winning chemistry instructor. You'll be able to ask the panelists questions and even cast your own virtual vote. Again, that webinar is on September 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can register for free on the ACS webinars website. We'll post a link in this episode's description. And while you're there, be sure to check out the full schedule of ACS webinars. Now. Back to the show. Coming back to my chat with Deborah, I couldn't resist asking her to compare the lack of food safety in the 19th century with today's infatuation with quote unquote chemical free food. Your book obviously arrives at a time when consumers have or are being sold a preoccupation with natural and organic and chemical free as much as we kind of <laughs> that, that so term you can't hear me crazy. rolling my eyes, yes. but I'm rolling my eyes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And so, you know, I mean, I think just a general mistrust of any sort of chemical additive. And I wondered if we could think about the context now of, you know, comparing the perception of adulteration then with how maybe people think about, you know, food now. That's a really smart point. So, I mean, one of the things that is going on here, and we're talking about the rise of industrial chemistry, everyone is going, well, we are, we are smarter than nature. We can create all these things in the laboratory. We can mimic natural products. We no longer have to use these low level vegetable dyes because we can make aniline coal tar dyes, which in fact we still use. And, and they're brighter and more beautiful. And so I think a lot of the zeitgeist then was sort of the wonder of science in a way that I think we're a little bit more cautious about how brilliant we are and how much smarter than nature we are today. And so I think people were much more excited about some of these synthetic things then and more trusting that it just was evidence of man's incredible intelligence and ability to transform the world. And this also comes up as a backstory of the book. The American public is just like, whatever. You know, so what that they're pouring these compounds in the food? My milk lasts longer. My meat looks pinker. It took a while for people to start going and some of it was Wiley's poison squad experiments, but some of it was people dying, right? Um, and some of it was this push by what they called pure food advocates to make people think differently. But for a while, it was just like, wow, all of these things that nature can do, we can do better. We, we're not like that now, right? So. I think even though the details and circumstances are different, this book drops at a time, a political time, when many of the themes feel familiar. And in your epilogue, you talk about that a little bit. And I wondered if you could just talk about how this book is positioned in today's context and if Wiley were alive today, where he would be focusing his energy. Yeah, I mean, that was something I really increasingly thought about because, as I said, when I started the book, I was just really thinking about crazy chemistry. And it was only as I was there spending hours and hours in the Library of Congress, which was wonderful to me, actually, that I started thinking, well, you know, really what I'm talking about is where we lay a foundation. This is one of the first consumer protection laws. We're laying the foundation for the way we do consumer protection in this country. We're regulating industries that don't want to be regulated. We're politically compromising and and working out the details of this. So you start seeing, uh, the, you know, the creation of, of of the way you do consumer protection policy in the United States and the way that politics interferes with that and the way that money and power interferes with the way we do consumer protection. And I started realizing that my story was not only this sort of deepening understanding of, of uh, how chemists can make us understand what makes food safe and not and how to apply that, but also the, a sort of American consumer protection policy. And that's hugely relevant today because 
first, we're, we're in a, a point where we have an administration that is responding to what I always think of as the myth of overregulation in the United States. You know, we've been telling ourselves this fairy tale that we're hugely overregulated when, in fact, if you go and look at, you know, neighboring countries or the way that they do consumer protection policy in Europe, it's much stricter in many cases. And there's many things that we allow in this country that are banned in Europe now because we don't regulate to the consumer first degree that they do. We do do this exact balance but from my book, which really looks at uh, the insistence of the federal government that we accommodate industry as we do regulations. And our regulations have always been very industry accommodating. So I wanted to really look at how we set that mindset and establish the way we do consumer protection. And then I wanted also to say something that I think we have to now really sort of almost take to the streets today, which is that maybe regulation is the wrong word for what we're talking about because we've demonized that word. Maybe the word really is consumer protection. But the, these are not regulations. These are consumer protective rules. And that we have not done that well enough, that to roll back the rules that we have, which have saved countless lives, countless lives, with food, with environmental policy, with pharmaceutical policies, the rules that we have put in place to protect the consumers who are at the receiving end of this industrial pipeline have saved hundreds and thousands, if not millions of lives. And the fact that we don't remember how dangerous food was doesn't excuse us. And so I see my book as doing a couple of things. It's a reminder of what the world was like and what the United States was like when we were just whatever with what any corporation did. And it's a reminder that we need to fight to preserve what we have. Kind of along those lines, one thing that I thought about when I was reading the book, you kind of saw when Wiley started to get some traction, like the first little bit of traction came with this meat, right? That mm -hmm. was like, had gone bad, people were getting sick, soldiers were getting sick. And right. I, it made me think about, you know, today, like, what is the group? You know, who? what, what are the, these catalysts, right, that sort of make people accept, I guess, regulation? That's a good point. And I should say that when you just heard me do that big rant, that was a Harvey Wiley rant. He would totally be out in the streets pushing f to save, and he fought to save regulations from the moment they came into place. So the event you're talking about was a famous scandal that we've all forgotten, uh, which involved meat that was purchased by the Army from the American meatpacking industry, mostly in Chicago, and shipped down to Cuba, where we were fighting the Spanish-American War. And afterwards, there was a scandal that actually came from uh, military officers uh, who said that the meat that was served to the soldiers there was of such poor quality that it had poisoned them, and they felt that it was formaldehyde. And and they coined the phrase embalmed beef because formaldehyde was a popular body preservative, especially after the Civil War. And later milk became known as embalmed milk, right? Same kind of thing. And there was a, a one particular general who made such an enormous fuss about the serving of embalmed beef, supported by all kinds of different people, including Teddy Roosevelt, who later testified publicly that he would rather eat his hat, that have eaten these supplies, who went in and they caused such a fuss and there were so many accusations that the army actually had to have two hearings. And their final hearing concluded that, and this will tell you a lot about what it was like, that the meat that was served to the army was no worse than the meat that was sold in American grocery stores, that all the meat contained these horrible preservatives, was poorly made and basically sucked. And that was one of the things I think that we see as kind of a tipping point because this was front page news all across the country. The Chicago Tribune, which was very friendly with the meatpacking industry, put it on the front page and called it the beef court. And so people started writing in and saying, man, I don't know about this. And it, it was a coalition of groups. On the issue of food, I don't think we have quite that kind of coalition. 
we had all kinds of, and, and Wiley gave them a huge thanks, but all of the women's groups. Are, and this is a period before women can vote. So their political influence was in organizing, right, and, and calling attention to things and educating other women. And so, but you see women's groups really taking on this issue and getting it out. Even the, um, the people who are fighting for prohibition and the Carrie Nations, they're taking on the issue of unsafe food and they're writing letters and they're pressuring congressmen. And one of the things, speaking of American history, that I didn't appreciate was that back Back then, uh, there were much more progressive states in, in the Midwest and the West and the South. Isn't that fascinating? So you see like the states of North and South Dakota driving this discussion. You have state food commissioners from Utah and Wyoming saying this is completely unacceptable. The legislators who were pushing food laws were quite often from Montana and some of these states that now s seem to swing politically a different way. And the Western states were the first states to allow women to vote, right? The old established East Coast states fought it, the South never. And so, but you see women really organizing about around these things and getting information out and crusading for it and supporting Wiley when he's trying to pressure legislature. It really was an amazing time where you also start seeing the birth of consumer protection. Uh, consumer Reports and the Consumer Protection League grows out of this exact time. And so I actually love, it's the second book I've done in the kind of fizz of the early 20th century. I love the fizz of the early 20th century. There were so many things wrong with it in the way we treated people. I mean, I'm not defending that. But it was like this really free-spirited, you say what you think kind of time in American history that brought all kinds of interesting people together. That coalition you talked about, I'm glad you brought up the role that women's groups played in getting this, the kind of momentum going behind this issue, because that was fascinating to me. I knew nothing about that. I don't think we give enough credit to all the work that women who had no voice in government because they couldn't vote did in trying to shape the future of the country, right? And of course, many of them were also fighting for women's right to vote. And Wiley's wife, Anna, uh, was actually arrested protesting the Woodrow Wilson White House and went to jail for it. So you see women really fighting and organizing, and it pulled women together in really interesting ways. And you see women deeply involved um, in education issues and social justice issues. Some of the, speaking of one of the issues we look at today is immigrants. You see women like Jane Addams, right, setting up settlement houses to help these new immigrants get uh, educated. And so there are so many themes that remind me of today. Yeah, I think another theme that I'll just touch on briefly, and I because I can't quite wrap my head around, I'd love your thoughts on this, whether it's like today or it diverges from today, <laughs> which is the role that the media played. Because obviously one of the things you talk about, and I thought this was fascinating, kind of understanding the role that the media played in catalyzing some of those changes. So yeah, everything we're talking about is newspapers, right? Radio is not really there. So I, there's millions of print publications at this point. I kind of love that. And being a longtime journalist, I also kind of like sniff. There used to be like, you know, 53 newspapers in New York or whatever. And so you get a lot of different approaches. There was a lot of sensationalistic media at the time. The Washington Post, in fact, when they were covering the Poison Squad trials, you just invented things. It drove Wiley crazy in the coverage of those trials. So you do see a lot of the sort of front page, stereotypical, flamboyant journalism of the time. Certainly that was famous during the Spanish-American War. And you see newspapers taking one side or the other, right? So you'll have a super crusading newspaper, you'll have a super conservative newspaper. I want to back up and say one more point. We're all talking about newspapers, and at that time, journalism was a, a deeply blue-collar profession. We think of it now as more of a white collar. You go to college, you get your journalism degree, right? Or your graduate degree. But at that time, you know, journalists were really down with the in the trenches with the people they covered. And so a lot of newspaper coverage then, unless it was the Wall Street Journal or one of these business publications, was very sympathetic to the people who were at the receiving end of these bad policies. And you really see this reflected in the way Wiley is covered, for instance, so that when 
he's out crusading. And when you see people actively as both businesses and people in government trying to destroy his career, the newspaper coverage is almost 100% sympathetic to Wiley. Uh, and that was actually one of the weapons he was able to use. Everyone gets that he's on the side of the poor schmuck who's drinking poisoned milk because they can't afford farm fresh milk. Newspapers really saw him as this unique protective uh, voice. And I hadn't actually thought about it till you mentioned it, but when I'm going through all of the newspaper clippings covering these different confrontations he has with people in government who are trying to shut him down, they're 99.9% .9 almost sympathetic to Wiley because the people who are writing them are, are exactly the people who are getting screwed over by these, not, you know, by the fact that food is dangerous. And so you see a very sympathetic press to Wiley. And you see this really actually and a political awareness of this by Teddy Roosevelt, by William Howard Taft, by Wiley's superiors at agriculture. The one thing that he has as things start working against him is an American press who tells the story in a way that is sympathetic to what he's trying to do. And you'll see both Taft and Roosevelt at different times saying, I did not want to mess with him because this will make me look bad in the media. And when he gets really under threat by his supervisors for some of his actions, the first thing he does is leak it to reporters. And so he also recognizes what a powerful tool this is. Um, I mean, the coverage was incredible. I, you couldn't fi almost couldn't find a newspaper. And I'm going through pages and pages and pages of newspaper files, and it's like little tiny newspapers and great big newspapers. So it's also a portrait of a different America. I mean, one of the things I think we have not figured out how to replace is your local newspaper where the people who work for it are just like you and you see them all the time and you trust them because you know them and so you saw that playing who do you trust people really trusted their hometown newspaper a great reminder as we near the end of this episode support local journalism okay we have one last question left for deborah but I first want to thank everyone for listening to our chat about Poison Squad. As a reminder, the book drops on September 25th, so you should grab your copy and then tweet at me with all your insightful thoughts on Harvey Wiley. I'm at Lisa M. Jarvis on Twitter. And I'd also love your ideas for our next book to review. Now, back to a final word from Deborah. I don't know if you are ready to talk about what you might be working on next, oh. but I gotta ask. <laughs> I'm an R and R, okay. right? <laughs> so, I mean, I've thought about things because I'm a writer, and so there's going to be a point that I haven't quite reached where the fact that I'm not writing will make me twitch. And so, I have a few ideas, but they're not going to be this kind of book. So, what I will tell you is, I've done four narrative science histories. I love doing them. I don't think I'm at a stage in my life where I'm positioned to do another, partly because I'm director of this program at MIT, in which I can't say to my, uh, the people in my program, we well, you know, I'll see you in six months. I'm going off to an archive, <laughs> right? And so whatever I tell, I think it's probably going to end up being more personal. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, and I and I and the idea that I'm kind of kicking around that I think everyone in my family dreads me doing this is to do a story. My father was an entomologist and a chemical ecologist. He actually wrote a a textbook called Chemical Defenses of Arthropods. And, but he was also a uniquely, and my mother would acknowledge this, like a uniquely crazy kind of guy. And so I've messed around in my head with, could I write a story that was partly about the, you know, insect chemistry and partly about growing up with a really crazy Yes, another chemist, you know, uh, a scientist who was fascinated by these sort of hidden stories that chemistry is and, and that defines who we are. And so if, if I do another one, I want to mess around with that. I just have to figure out how much I want to tell. <laughs> Well, we will be excited to read it no matter what it is. I really appreciate you taking the time today, Deborah. We are so, so excited and everyone should read the book. I know our audience is going to love it. So thank you. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure, Lisa. And, and I should say I'm such a fan of chemical and engineering news. So I'm super excited to be here. 
Huge thanks to Deborah and to Lisa for reporting this episode for us here at Stereo Chemistry. Remember to hit her up on Twitter if you have books you want her to talk about on the podcast. She's at Lisa M. Jarvis. The music you're hearing right now is Drive Till Dawn by Rocket Max, and the music you heard during that Nobel webinar ad was The Confrontation by Poddington Bear. And the song that started out the episode was Glass Bells Dancing with the Synthesizer by Daniel Birch. Stereo Chemistry will return the last week of October with another spooky good episode. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe and check out any episodes you may have missed on iTunes, Google Play, or TuneIn. Thanks for listening.